Welcome everyone to a new episode of Tales of the 2S LGBTQ+. My name is Douglas Parsons. A few months ago, I began what is called a reflection series. In that, Michael Fair and Liz Messiah talked about the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. I want to continue having a reflection series, but this time I've brought in two people to discuss leather. What has brought them into it? Where is the leather community today? And more information that goes from there. Scott Bryan and Monique Wilson are my guests today, and they're going to bring a special insight to everything. It's more than just what you've seen on screen, what you have seen in pictures. Lifestyle, fetish, we'll talk more about that here today on this episode of Tales of the 2S LGBTQ+. Before I bring both of them to your screen and or your listening ears, I wanna make mention that Tales of the 2S LGBTQ+, is the weekly video and audio podcast that showcases the remarkable people found within our rainbow community. By listening to our stories, I hope that you recognize your story. And from that, gain insight, understanding, and connection. So let's continue to connect weekly to learn about people we become smitten with. If you're listening on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, be sure to give a rating, a review, that always helps us. And of course, if you're watching here on YouTube, click the button for subscribe, and that way you'll get notifications when the next episode is there for you to listen to. I'm based here in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and it's important for me to say that as I like to acknowledge that I'm living within Treaty 6 territory and within the Métis homelands and Métis nation of Alberta, Region 4, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. I acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I'm grateful for the knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today and those who came before. I continue to open myself up to listen, to learn and to understand. And I hope you join me on this journey as we learn truths. I make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those of the territory we reside. Today on Tales of the 2S LGBTQ+, we continue with the Reflection Series and our topic today, discussing the leather community. My guests are Scott Bryan and Monique Wilson, and it's my pleasure to bring them up here on your screen. Welcome to Tales of the 2S LGBTQ+. Well, hi, Doug. Thanks for having us. It's wonderful to have you. Uh, Scott was one of my first guests on this series, and he talked about the leather community, a leather 101. And so I invite everyone to go check out on our YouTube channel, as well as our podcast channels, that interview where you can learn more. For both of you, if I was to ask you the question, what is the leather community? What would be your answer? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that there's a, a answer to that. I think you'll have a different answer depending on who you're speaking to. And I think every community would define it differently and every person within its community would define it differently. But for me, it's a group of like-minded people who believe in community and honesty and integrity and trying to be the best person they can while being kinky. I agree. I mean, the point, we're going to have to go right back into what you think leather is, but leather is a personal journey of exploration. Mm -hmm. So you're never going to get the same answer from two people because it is their journey that they're going to be describing. And nobody has exactly the same journey as somebody else. So there's some basics that we all sort of agree with. Yes, we, we all agree with 
you know, respect and communication. And we have a dog here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We, as leather folk, tend to view ourselves more as explorers, sexual outlaws, if you can put it that way. Yeah. And we don't follow the societal norms as to what people think a uh, sexual relationship should be. We tend to push the edges of the boundaries constantly. So when you ask, you know, what's leather? My leather is my leather. Mm -hmm. uh, Monique's leather is Monique's leather. And while we might have a couple of things in common, they aren't the same. They're not. And it's funny, different people join a leather community for different reasons. And uh, those reasons will impact their journey and how much they get out of the community or not. Or how much they put into it. Or not. Yes. For our audio listeners, I want to just paint a picture. Scott is this strong, stoic type. And if you can imagine in your mind, he'd be somebody that you could see perhaps working on an engine of a car. Just for a mental part. <laughs> I would break a nail. I would never do that. <laughs> I'm just putting the image in the mind. And Monique, this is our first time meeting. And I would be like, hey, Monique is my grade three language arts teacher. <laughs> yeah, pretty and much. So I'm stuck here going, I'm having a conversation about leather. Because leather is the Tom of Finland, that, that stoic figure that's in the corner smoking a cigar and sending off that vibe, that come hither look. At least that's the stereotype. And so I'm struck here in this conversation with how did you find the leather community? Or did the leather community find you? You can explain your journey and then I'll stop in, okay? All right. For me, it was sort of by accident. And thank goodness. I think I knew I was kinky for as long as I can remember. And when I found a kink community in the late 90s, I was both ecstatic and dismayed. Ecstatic because I found people who are like-minded but the community I found, it was kind of like wearing shoes that didn't fit. They looked good, but they hurt my feet. It just not, it just didn't feel right, which was the pansexual community. And the, nothing wrong with that group. It just wasn't me at all. And then by, by some fluke, you showed up at the garage one day mm -hmm. while we were having a munch. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, hello. <laughs> and uh, when I was pretty, he's still pretty, and I still go, hello, <laughs> and uh, still pretty. And walked up to him and with the person I was with then, and we just struck a friendship. Absolutely. It just felt like instant friendship. And then through him, found out that there was a group called Northern Chaps at the time, which were Leather Boys. <laughs> And they would meet at Buddy's every second Saturday. Uh -huh. I said, well, I'm going there. And for me, it was like coming home. And the guys there were super welcoming because at that time, I think I was the first woman who was just showing up every time. One of the first. And uh, it felt like home. The vibe, how people interacted with each other. On those nights, everybody's all geared up and looking, you know, less like mechanics and an arts teacher. <laughs> And it was fun and it felt like home for me. And uh, for me, there was no turning back. That was my, leather was my home. Yeah, and uh, very similar for myself. I mean, I was invited to a leather party back when I was very trendy, I think was probably the word. I, I was certainly, you know, shopping at Big Steel and, you know, wearing the latest fashions. This was in the 80s. So there was a lot of shoulder pads. Miami Vice. Yeah, picture Miami Vice. That was the look I was going for. And I got talking to a couple of people. I've always been sort of 
outgoing anyway. And they invited me to a leather party. And I thought, that sounds fun. <laughs> I'll try anything once. <laughs> well, I'd had my own sort of imagery in the back of my own head. And there was certainly, I, I'm pretty sure I was kinky right from the beginning anyway, but I just didn't have any way to express it. So I showed up at this leather party <laughs> in a pair of khaki shorts and a white t-shirt. <laughs> oh. oh, no. <laughs> moosed up hair which yeah well yeah and i had hair then too and it was all moosed up because that was well, that was the time the boys weren't having much of it at all thank god i decided not to go commando that day because the shorts were off and the shirt was off and the shoes were off and the next thing i know i was in a rope harness and people were asking me how i felt and it was like monique explained it was like coming home it was like you found your tribe. It's like things click. Yeah, it, it's like an internal click inside your head. And I, it, I'm still friends with a lot of the people that actually were at that first leather meet that I went to. And, you know, once I found the bug, then it just sort of progressed from there. You both use the word kinky when describing yourselves in that. So if I was to ask you a definition for that word, would it be similar to the definition for leather in that kink and kinky means something different for everybody? Or is there's more definition to it? There is more definition to it. I mean, if I look at it, leather involves a certain amount of kink, but kink doesn't necessarily have to involve leather. Exactly. So leather is sort of an overarching philosophy if i can put it that way yeah it's more about how we think and feel than what we do yeah, exactly and the expression of your sexuality is just sort of part and parcel with leather but doesn't necessarily have to be associated with leather. i know kinky people that aren't leather at all mm -hmm. but i know a lot of leather people that aren't particularly kinky either <laughs> yeah you know so they they aren't exclusive but they aren't mesh together either we just happen to both be oh. kinky as hell and leather at the same time my type of people it's great <laughs> that's us the deviants <laughs> <laughs> well leather culture is typically associated with the gay community but leather quote unquote leather is generally an umbrella term and then there's a direction within that to be more inclusive, to include all genders, sexual orientations. Has that always been the case? Or uh, has it been a long time coming to get to here? It's been an evolution. I think so. I mean, there's, in the dyke community, there was definitely leather dykes. There was always leather dykes. There was there always was leather boys, boys as well. The two communities didn't necessarily mix yes. all that often and they don't necessarily mix that well everywhere no either they don't. edmonton for some reason does but I, can there's tell, not... I can tell you why edmonton does oh it's, I'd it's love pretty to know. easy yeah. edmonton is a small isolated mm. city and it really is it's where we're sort of at the end of the trunk and there isn't a whole lot around us that you don't have to spend three hours in a car to go to that's the closest. So consequently, there isn't a huge number of us. So we were you know, just pulled together because there was more of a community vibe if you pull other people in that are somewhat similar. And that's exactly what Edmonton was all about. The leather community and the drag community mm -hmm. and the pops and the Pansex pansexuals, mm -hmm. they, they all sort of gathered together in one area because in a number of ways we were all sort of fighting the same type of battle yeah i mean back in the day <laughs> back in, back the, in day. the day yeah. let back me get my cane back in the day, <laughs> um there were no public parties they they didn't exist like it wasn't that like 20 some odd years ago, we were still really underground. The idea of having anything public was like shocking. And the first public party 
was with Lupercalia, and it was not till the third or fourth Fourth one. one, yeah, somewhere in that range. And for many years, the only public party there ever was, was once a year with Lupercalia Convention. For those of us, you know, for those of you and your listeners who don't know what Lupercalia was, it was a celebration of everything kinky <laughs> in Edmonton, usually in February for some ungodly reason. Oh, I, I know think, the reason for that. I, I think it had a lot to do with cash. <laughs> no, actually, Lupercalia was the celebration that the Catholic Church, I believe, bastardized to make Easter. And it was a celebration held in February where there was actual floggings and you would get flogged to promote uh, the harvest. And there was a lot of sex and floggings and... It was just, Roman. It was, it was Roman. <laughs> it was very Roman. <laughs> so so, so anyway... Think that the farmers should be thanking all of you because you've been flogged? <laughs> yeah, they, they should be. It's been very, very <laughs> plethora of good crops because of what we were doing. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why we were doing it, of course, only, you know, for the farmers. Yeah, it was only for the farmers. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Hey, there's going to be somebody <laughs> who's listening in rural Alberta. Me, and there's, like, there's enough kinky farmers out there. I know a lot of them. I grew up in central Alberta. The answer is yes to that. Yes, yes the answer is yes sure. to that. When you have a whole lot of Baylor twine and a whole lot of time to yourself, things happen. <laughs> <laughs> on the next Tales of the 2SL <laughs> Scott and Monique will be showing us what to do with Baylor Twine. <laughs> oh, oh. Well, I haven't done a scene like that in a while. Mm, that could be fun. We now will have a commercial break as they now. <laughs> so, here's what I know from growing up. I've made mention of my age range. And so I graduated in 1993 from high school. And so when I was growing up, of course, my first experience seeing somebody in leather would be with the village people. And then I remember seeing some things with cruising the movie. Mm -hmm. Then of course, whatever got seen with TV, movies, et cetera. If you take a look at the cartoons that were coming out in the 80s and 90s, they always seem to throw a leather daddy into some scene. Like almost every scene, there was a leather daddy in the cartoons. Yeah, it's a great visual. It's a fantastic visual. But what I learned was that, especially during the AIDS crisis, there was uh, lesbians who jumped up and helped the drag queens. But what I also found in researching is that with the leather scene from the 80s, the people in there were still saying, sex is good, enjoy life. But there's ways of doing this where you can have sexual enjoyment that doesn't mean penetration. Live your life, keep going and be sexual and creating that safe space. And so I always look at the leather community as a sex positive and here's what we can do in a place of learning. How has the leather community helped you with your learning? That's a deep question. That really is a deep question. Do you want me to go first? Yeah. Yeah, Okay, fine. You think for a while. (laughs) If I take a look at what the leather community has actually encouraged me to do, is to give myself permission to explore. Mm -hmm. It's given me the courage to say, with a lot of sexual practices, until I experience it, I can't judge it. Mm -hmm. So consequently, it's opened my horizons considerably over the period that I've been involved with the leather community. But the biggest impact it's had on me was really to allow myself to say it's okay i don't need to worry about somebody else's opinion of me what i need to worry about is my opinion of myself 
And that allows you to sort of walk through your life with a certain amount of confidence that a lot of people who look at the leather community from the outside automatically see. And then when you see leather folk, they are generally very confident in who and what they are because they've spent the time to really find out who and what they are. They put in the time and they've done the work. Mm -hmm. And when you do that type of thing, it sort of spreads out into the rest of your life. So yes, sexually that was part of it, but it was far more than just sexual. Mm -hmm. I would even add to that. <clears throat> and if you're lucky to find your, your people within the community and, and the word community yeah, we have a little problem with the word community you know, anyway. Just because you bowl doesn't mean you're, you trust and you're best friend with every bowler. It's kind of the same in kink. So there's like the kink community. But within that community, if you're fortunate enough to find your people. Then that's your family. And so now, yeah, not only are you given permission, if you will, to explore and have the confidence to do so, you also have a safe space, if you will. Because no matter where you go, if you end up in the wrong place, you've got people to support you. And somebody's going to go pick you up when somebody's, you fall down. Mm -hmm. So within that community, if you're fortunate enough to find your people, your tribe, your whatever you want to call it, then not only do you have permission to explore not it's not even permission, it's encouragement. It's, it is encouragement. It's almost <laughs> like kids in a candy shop. You know, there's like a certain gravitas, as Scott said, you know, we come across as pretty stoic, especially when we're all geared up and we look confident, but we're also like a bunch of kids in a candy shop. It's like, <laughs> so yeah, you're encouraged and support, but then it, it creates this bubble of safe to try things, to try things you might never try without. Hmm. And if you do that, then you grow as a person. I can't even, it, whether it goes well or not. Well, especially if it doesn't, then you sort of walk away with a whole lot of lessons. Like, I'll oh, never do that. Yeah. You, know, but... <laughs> you learn, you but, do. but you feel safe in trying because you know, you'll be okay. I was really looking forward to this conversation today because when I look back on what I think of as the leather community or leather family, the people who I see within it, of course, my first thought is Scott because he was the first person within the community who I saw all the lights around him <laughs> exactly they say, no, I'm going to say the elephant in the room type thing here as well because hey I've been on a I diet was <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to rephrase all this part but when I thought of the leather community, leather families, as I mentioned, the Tom of Finland, that look. I never did mentally put a woman into that imagery. And so for yourself, Monique, did you ever feel that as a woman within the leather community, that you had to keep it a secret or that you were allowed to open up and say, here I am to the rest of the world. Not, not for me personally, but then I think, like I said, I'm lucky. I kind of found my people early, people who accepted me. I never tried to look like Tom of Finland, which would have been a little bit ridiculous, I think. Given that I'm like five foot fuck all and it curves all over the place, it would have looked ridiculous. Yeah, but I mean, Tom of Finland really is a male look. Yeah. But there is a female look in leather that mm. is hyper feminized. Yeah, that's more me. Yep. And believe me, I have helped more women get the girls level in a <laughs> bustier <laughs> or uh, a corset than you might want to think of. I probably had my hands on more tits than most straight men have. It's, and, you know, although Tom of Finland is kind of like the imagery that we have of leather. Well, there's also Ilso the SS too. I mean, you're thinking about, yeah. you know, a strong female dominatrix. 
So, I mean, that goes around too, but you see a lot of female subs going around too, which have their own look. And you have a lot of boys that have a sub look to them. So, I mean, th there really isn't just the one look for leather. There's mm -hmm. as many looks as you can possibly think of. And although the, the clothes, especially if you're out in public, are kind of part of it, I mean, who doesn't feel good when you're all kind of geared up? It, you know, it just it, it just adds an element. It does. Uh, leather is not about the clothes. It's about what's in here. It I've really is. I've seen somebody walk around in a conference in sweatpants and a t-shirt and sneakers. And yeah. There was you, no doubt. And saw somebody else walking around. It's like they took a picture and went, "What? what's the gear I need? Bought all the gear and you're kind of going, yeah. Sorry, dude. Yeah, well, <laughs> you true. look good, but you, you, you look fine. But you might want to take the price tags off of things. You know? <laughs> so, it's really not about. It's not about the clothes. It's although the clothes add a certain je ne sais quoi. Well, like I said, you yeah. feel you feel like you know when you get all geared up. You, you I know, you walk different, and it just feels good. Hell, but, it got me laid a lot. I mean. <laughs> Nobody would really look at me twice if I wasn't geared up oh, in skin tight leathers. No, it's true. What? You know, I'm pretty yeah, average. This is when Mummy and I just look at each other and like, yeah, no, no. Well, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Well, but clo whatever. I mean, clothes make people feel good outside of the leather community. I mean, you get all dressed up, you feel good. It adds to your self confidence and. You know, oh, you, absolutely. You dress sexy, whether it's leather or not, you feel sexy. In 1929, Virginia Woolf wrote a feminist text called A Room of Her Own. In the writing, she argued for a woman's need to think and create. Monique, how have you been able to create a space for yourself within the leather family where you have been able to think and create a room of your own? Hmm. That's a good question. It's a good question, but it's hard only because I think I've been lucky and I've never felt like I had to fight. I've never felt, I've always felt like I could just be a hundred percent me. That was so much part of what felt when I said, you know, I found my people and it felt like everything clicked is for the first time I felt I could just be me. And even though I'm a woman in what was at that time predominantly male, mm -hmm. and I'm not dominant, I'm more, well, I'm not even really submissive, but I, I bought them. And you're um, a bratty sub. Well, that's true. <laughs> I want to not. I never felt my voice was silence. I always felt I was listened to, and I always was able to just. Do it, but I know that's not necessarily the case for everybody, whether they're female or not. And I know it can be difficult if you're the token person or you're trying to break through in a group. And so I'm fortunate. I don't think I'm a really good person to ask because I've never felt that need to fight for anything. Well, I, I just want to add something in here. I, I've been involved with a number of communities, both across Canada and the U.S. and it really depends on the personalities that are representative of the local community as to how well you can fit into that type of thing. There are a lot of communities where you have major gatekeepers, major gatekeepers who like to dictate what right and what's wrong and how you can do specific things and what is correct. When in fact, that's never been Edmonton's leather scene. Edmonton's leather scene has always been about encouraging people to find their own power, encouraging people to go and explore to find out who they are, Ex you know, really encouraging people to dig deep and become the best version of themselves that they can possibly be. And, and really, that has been the key of the Edmonton leather community for years. Drifted a bit in the last five or six years, I would say. But that may be just a changing of the guard. I mean, you're talking about back in the day when we were doing it, kids 
that are our age back then now starting to pick up the ropes. And as such, they're starting to redefine what it means to them in the current context of what this world is like. Yeah, and it's It was a very different world for us back then. Yeah. When you were mentioning the word gatekeeper, is that old guard, new guard? Is that where that comes in? Or is that something partially. completely different? No. Partially. Partially. And and you, you will find gatekeepers, I think, in every community. You can find gatekeepers. It's not just in the leather community, but you can find gatekeepers in any in community. Any community yeah. Where somebody, I think it depends who's kind of perceived or who is taken on the mantle as the leader of the community. There's always leaders. I think what made it easy for me in the day was... Scott and I became friends. It was obvious we were friends. Scott was a leader of the community. So kind of like, oh, Scott thinks she's okay. She must be okay. I know that helped a lot. I know it did. To a certain extent, yes, I suppose it did. But there will always be some people who feel there's just the one way to do things. and When, in fact, our philosophy was there is no one right way. No. Because nobody's the same. Nobody's the same, and it's a personal journey. And quite frankly, somebody put it to me very succinctly. If you are going to model your life after somebody and mimic it completely, then you are taking the lazy way out. You are not doing the work to find out who you are and where your strengths lay. Yeah, it's not authentic. Yeah, it's not authentic. Let's talk more about Edmonton in this case. And you've mentioned it, Northern Chaps. Northern Chaps being very influential and in many things that uh, the group has done. Can you give us a brief historical teaching of what is Northern Chaps? Okay, the 50 Cent Tour. Northern Chaps was a group of men that gathered together in the early 80s. I think it was 82, if I'm not mistaken. Before my time. Yeah. And it was small to begin with. There was only three or four guys. But as more people started to see the leather folk out, they started to give themselves permission to actually come out in gear and see what the community was like. Northern Chaps was quite a force in the city of Edmonton. They did a number of things to demystify leather because most people would just look at the, you know, the big nasty guy in the black leather head to toe and he's going to kill me type thing. When in fact, the majority of people that I've met in the leather community are some of the most kind, intelligent people I've ever met in my life. Now, they will beat the hell out of you, but you better say yes and you better commit to it before any of that is going to happen. Northern Chaps lasted for about 27 years, and mostly it closed down because the people that were in leadership positions were getting old and tired and nobody else was picking up the banner at the time so it was dissolved i mean if i've always been of the opinion that if something survives it's because there is a requirement for it and if something fades down for a while and then reinvents itself that's also a part of life i mean things change constantly so at this point, we're just in the stages where leather is starting to reassert itself again in this city. And it is a brand new bunch of people mm -hmm. and it is uh, done according to the current morals of society right now, which is far more permissive than we ever experienced back in the day. Yeah. I hate to say that, but it's it's true. And to see it, it pass into history is fine because it served its purpose for the time it was around. As a matter of fact, I'm wearing one of the last Northern Taps tees 
right now. And it's still recognized every time I wear this, mm -hmm. to tell you the truth. So the, the mythos about the group hasn't disappeared, but it may not be 100% valid for today's state of mind. Yeah, back then there was nothing public. I mean, the leather knights at Buddies were. They were big. They were big, and they, but they were part of the, it was a bit scary because it was not as, I mean, you see kink in everything and everywhere now. It's not the big bad boogeyman that it used to be. It's gone almost mainstream. Yep, pretty much after, um, you know, I hate to say it, 50 shades of gray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the internet. So it's accessible, whereas it wasn't accessible before. No. It, it took me a long time to find people that were like minded. I was from a small town on the east coast of Canada. And every time I tried to bring it up with partners, I would get like, oh, you know, I thought I was, I felt like I was wrong. I felt wrong. I felt well, like, we, I remember trying AOL for the first time oh, and oh. getting the disc, remember? <laughs> you Dial got, up. You got mail. Got mail <laughs> and finding the, the kinky chat rooms and crying, thinking I'm, I'm not the only one. Because yep. you didn't see it in media. I'd read the story in university. But that was my only exposure, kind of like, okay, but the, there's at least one other person who thinks like I do. She wrote a damn book. And she's not alive anymore. No, she will. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was hard. Now with the internet, it's so accessible. It's all over the place. It's, which is yeah. it's a blessing and a curse, like anything. Now, you were an honorary member of Northern Chaps Monique in the late 90s, early 2000s. I have to ask the question here, why were you only an honorary member? I don't know. I think had I pushed to be an, a full-fledged member, I probably would have not had a lot of pushback. I just never did. I was, I think, pretty content. Like I said, times were different then. It, there, it, it just... there was also a reason for that. The, the way that the bylaws were actually written for Northern Chaps, it was male. So we had to change those bylaws to allow females in and transgender in. And a lot of that happened in the mid-90s is when it really started to change. Yeah, so... I don't know. I, I don't think I felt the need. I think I was getting, like, I never asked. I was never told no. I just never asked. I just, I think I was getting what I needed at the time. Yeah, I was getting what I need. I didn't need the card. <laughs> I, you know, it, it wouldn't have changed anything for me at the time. You already knew what the secret handshake was. You had the decoder ring already. So... What else did you need, so to speak, when it comes to that? What else did now, I need, so to speak? Exactly. So when, in talking to you just before we recorded here, uh, I do know that you did move away from Edmonton for a little while. I did. And so when you came back to Edmonton and seeking out community and seeking out family, what did you notice that was different? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. I mean, some things were the same. Uh, Scott and I never lost contact. So landing here was really easy for me and it made it easy for my master as well, uh, because he also threw me through coming in for conference and Scott and other people coming to PC for conferences. He had already gotten to know. So the getting... matter of fact, you introduced me to your master. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was easy. And I think because by the time we came back, I'd been part of the lifestyle for over 20 years and my master for over 40. You, the need for the, the need for the big C community, going to the munches, et cetera, et cetera, is not there anymore. You can't, by now you've made your group, you've got your crew, you've got your people and we're a little bit older. So going out every weekend and every night for something is just not as appealing anymore. Born to be wild till 9 p.m. But what blew, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I can be as wild as anybody as long as I'm home by nine. Uh, 
But what blew me away was how many young people, because when we first started, there were not a lot of young, like real, like in their 20s. No, no, nah, there not wasn't. Babies. It was something you grew into, and it was typically mid-30s up. Yeah. And the choices. I mean, geez, Louise, you could go to a munch every night of the week in Edmonton right now, or pardon me, pre-COVID, you could go to a party every weekend. Mm -hmm. Some weekends you have a choice between one or two. But, I mean, back in the day, I was part of the EOS. We had meetings once a month, and one of the members would have people over at his house afterwards, mm -hmm. Gary. Yep. Gary and Sue. I mean, and without Gary and Sue having house parties, this was even before I met you, I wouldn't have even known what like play looked like. I knew what it looked like in my head, but in practical terms. So yeah, things have changed. Considerably. It's Considerably. far more open than it used yeah. to be. Far, far more open than it used to be. Because it's so open now, does that make it more difficult than to have an official group that speaks for everybody that you can organize? Yeah, it does. And I'm going to relate this to uh, a gay matter right now, and you'll see the parallels. We fought long and hard for the basic human rights that everybody in this country gets. And by and large, we've been very successful at integrating ourselves into society with all of the rights and benefits that any other citizen has, regardless of who we choose to sleep with, period. In the process of that fight, however, we've lost some of the we-they situation because back in, and I'm going to use this again, I'm sorry, I can't think of a better term for it, but back in the day, gay bars were not just bars, they were a social center for the whole community. That's where we met. That's where we planned what we were going to do. That's where parties came out of. That's where events were put together at the bar. That's where you met because it was literally the only place in your life where you could drop all of the masks and the pretenses that kept you safe in regular day-to-day -day life. Well, with us gaining the societal acceptance, you're finding that the majority of gay bars are starting to disappear very quickly because there isn't a need, a need specifically for them. I mean, gay boys go out to whatever bar they want to right now. Straight boys not necessarily all that straight anymore, to tell you the truth. And the same for girls. I mean, they're not necessarily all that straight anymore. They, they actually tend to, from what I see, respond to a person and then figure out what they're going to do with their genitalia later. Well, no, it's true. That's, yeah. that's it. They'll figure it out as the time goes. But the reason we had gay bars was far more than just a place to drink. It was a place where you could drop all of the pretense and be yourself mm -hmm. for a short period. Was, of whenever I walked into a place that was gay owned, there was that step through the door, you did a couple steps in, and then you just took that breath. And then it was like, everything fell everything away. Everything came off. And yeah, everything came off and you were yourself. And then you make an eye contact with somebody. Exactly. Exactly. Well, the leather community has sort of gone through the same type process where what we did, which was so misunderstood and certainly prejudged, is not so much anymore, to tell you the truth. And a lot of it has been demystified because a lot of people have opened the doors and said, look, this is, this is who we are. This is, you know, we're, we're still, you know, putting pants on one leg at a time and paying our mortgage like everybody else. And they find that there's, there's more in common with us than there is that separates us. So if I draw a parallel between the two, that really has been the evolution of the leather community as well as the gay community in this integration into society as a larger. 
And that goes for, like, you notice that neither Monique or I have talked about sexuality specifically in heterosexual terms or in homosexual terms, because it really doesn't matter in the leather community. 100%. Sexiest scenes I've ever had was with a gay man. There was no sex, but it was one of the hottest, sexiest scenes I ever had. It didn't matter. We were both into a certain kink. We did a scene together and it was amazing. And we both came out, came out of it feeling pretty, pretty good. <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The sexuality didn't come into it. Is, is what we're trying to say. So leather almost in some ways transcends your sexuality. So let's talk about the stories and let's talk about some of the people because by doing a podcast like this, we are collecting memories and making sure that stories move on and not just here's what it is. But mm -hmm. for both of you, who are some of those influential people who have helped you in this journey? Okay. Well, there was a number of men that actually really did sort of guide me along my first steps of the journey. So people like Mike Carrillo, Tom Picard, unfortunately, he just passed away. Fred Dicker, several other names are escaping me right now. I can see their faces. I just can't put names to them. Where am I? I, I <laughs> If I can just interject here, an episode of Tales of the 2S LGBTQ Plus is going to be released with Fred Dicker right around the same time as this interview will be out in the world. So uh, Fred Dicker, and when you're talking about Tom, was he nicknamed 25 cents or am I thinking somebody else? You're thinking of somebody else. Okay, sounds good. I'll delete that part later on. There was somebody I remember when I was first coming out that if you gave him 25 cents, he would whip it out and put it out into your hand. Oh, I remember him. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yes, I, I remember him quite well. He was also, he had had, I believe it was testicular cancer, and he'd had both of them removed, and they had actually replaced them with, I, I don't know what you call them, to tell you the truth. Prosthesis? But <laughs> prosthesis, but I mean, and one of his favorite things, because he was very much into, uh, and this is going to come out wrong, but he was very much into scrotum stretching, so he could really stretch his scrotum quite a distance. So it was not uncommon for him in the middle of the bar to pull out his balls and smack them on the counter three or four really yeah. good times, which he couldn't feel at all, but everybody else sort of went. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, all of this, this part I'll take out of the, the podcast and all that stuff. I and mean, maybe I'll keep it in or whatever. But I remember when all of a sudden with the, with the pay phones, it had changed from 25 cents to 35 cents. <laughs> and I remember him saying, if it, if you, it's 35 cents now, because if you want to get a rise out of me, 35 cents for inflation. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I remember that. That that was that was a while ago, but I do remember him yeah, quite that well. Was. Yeah. That was. Okay. So you mentioned Michael and Tom and Fred. Why were these three men so influential? Well, a lot of it happened to be that they were sort of the absolute founders of Northern Chaps. And they really were the ones who encouraged me to do some self-exploration and become the person that I am, which is why I sort of stood up and de facto became the face of leather in to say western canada for a while yeah actually and, and money canada. what about yourself the first name that comes to mind is even before i i really knew there was like a gay leather group was hardy haberman oh god yeah okay and uh, he came and was a keynote speaker at the very first lupercalia conference that was a whole weekend not not just the day long one yep. but and I remember him giving a keynote speech and my jaw like just dropped because I thought, wow, like this guy is so cool. 
And kind of like what you were saying before, because he was all in his gear and he looks just kind of like almost unapproachable. But then I approached him and he was so nice. Oh my goodness. So nice. One of the scenes I did with him and it just like blew my mind. And after that started researching and shortly after met Scott, you would be my second person. Oh, really? Yeah, because I didn't know a lot about weather prior to that. I just knew when I walked into, well, we connect, we just clicked. Yeah, we did. Right, right from the start. And then just going to Buddy's, it just felt, felt like, like home. home. And then probably the third person is my master. Although uh, he didn't really call himself weather. Although no, he, he didn't. He got called out as leather. But he is. But he he walked. He walks the walk. He doesn't just talk the talk. I mean, talk about investing your your time and your energy and community, and doing it for the right reasons, not so much for hey, look at me, uh, because he's not that kind of person at all. But he'll step up all the time, no matter what. And so I've been fortunate enough to have people that. You As Scott said, you don't want to emulate, but there's kind of like guidepost or. Yeah. Yeah, what you do is you find people who can show you what your own potential can be. Yeah. And that's really what it is. You don't necessarily want to be that other person, but no. you can see the journey that they've gone through and what they've become. And that gives you the personal strength to start looking inward and find out what you can become. Yeah. For me, one of the lessons was we talk about community a lot, but I've always believed sort of like a house in a home, a, a, a house is not a home unless everybody who lives in it contributes. Well, a community is the same. Mm -hmm. If you want a healthy, thriving, positive community, you have to contribute to it. And you also have Can't to be, be a healthy, positive, and contributing yourself. Walk the walk. And, and contributing doesn't have to look the same for everybody. Everybody's well, got talents. Nice. I've been always much more of a behind-the-scenes kind of person. No kidding. I, I, but I'll, I'll do what needs to be done. My butt has enough fingerprints on her. Just yeah, I was just going to say <laughs> that I, knowing Scott, there was a little bit of a double entendre there, and I picked up on that. <laughs> we were waiting for Monique to pick up on it. There. Yes. You know, it was a little slow. Yeah. But, I mean, and that's what I tell younger people who ask, like, yeah. who have questions. I said, you know, be, be what you want. Contribute. You can't sit back and, and complain about something if you're not part of the solution. And I will say one thing that I'm going to pick up on what you just said. <clears throat> we don't lecture people at all. We mm -hmm. have to wait for somebody to mm -hmm. ask mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. first before mm -hmm. we speak to them. Because I would never want to be one of those gatekeepers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and always with the preface of, well, this is my point of view, or this has been my experience, and this is Your how mileage I vary. see things. <laughs> And it may be different for you. That, like, what do you want out of it? It may not be what I want out of it. Absolutely. Speaking of mileage, you've known each other since the 90s. And it's evident for people watching and for listening that love that you have for each other. No, I hate this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no evidence. No evidence. <laughs> But what would you say when you would look back on each other and just say, hey, Scott, what have you seen in Monique's growth since the first time you met her? Oh, today? my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Don't talk about the pants, <laughs> I'm not talking about and that. And you can what talk I, about anything, I will take notes. When I met Monique, she was, believe it or not, she was very shy around mm -hmm. me, like painfully, painfully shy. It was difficult to get her 
to actually put two or three words together before she would go beat red and run off into a corner. I know that. That's I did the same thing with you, Scott. So I understand. Yeah, but, and I, I just don't get it. But anyway, what I've seen in the years that I've known Monique is that she has become a woman who knows her own power, who is very, very cognizant of what she is good at, what she is not good at. And she still has this ability to open a new door when she wants to. When she finds something that excites her, she will open that door and throw herself in hook, line, and sinker, and I admire that in somebody. I really do. She has become one of these rock-solid people who gives back to a community anytime it is asked of her, and sometimes even when it's not asked of her. She's intelligent, she's sharp, she's funny, she's a pleasure to be around, and she blushes really easy. <laughs> Oh, it's warm in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's the growth I have seen in Monique since we have known each other. Now, there have been, you know, a few little, you know, pushes along the way. I seem to recall oh. one birthday party. Mm. But, yeah, well, <laughs> yep. she's never going to ask me to bartend again. It wasn't a birthday. It was New Year's. Was it New Year's? And it was, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Martinis. Bad. No, you love them. Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> you were so much fun that night. Mm. And what was his name? That, uh, I can't remember, but you talked somebody no. out of the globe. Oh, that was almost every party, though. <laughs> almost every party, I had this this thing about getting people late. We would sometimes show up at parties here yep. and be uh, with my ex, and we'd be the only kind of straight couple. And I would just kind of do my own thing and I would see the shy boys and I'd say, okay, I'm going to get you late tonight. And I would get them late. You every would time. every fucking time. <laughs> no, that party, the martini was, I was on Stefan's lap. Yes, you were. Oh. And Stefan was motorboating you. Yes, he was. <laughs> It that's, was wonderful. <laughs> that's, that's another story for another yeah. day. What about yourself? When you look at Scott and, you know, Scott has always to me seen fully realized as to who he is now, just because mm -hmm. I've known him for that one. But you have mm -hmm. a special relationship with him. You see the changes. How has he grown since you've met him? I agree with you. For, well, and I agree with him for the first little while, like, and even to this day, he's larger than life in my eyes. There's only one person I hold in higher esteem and it's only by this much and I, you know, I'm married to him. And so for me, Scott's always been larger than life, but at the same time, I've always been a whole person. Like you've never been past like the first few months getting to know each other since we became friends you were never a caricature to me I think unfortunately being somebody like Scott who's large in community who is the poster child for community it's great it can be good for your ego but it's also very difficult because a lot of people create their image of Scott and make Scott a caricature and it's not fair. So I've gone past the stage where you're not a character in my mind, you're a full on person. I think the only thing I would say, cause I've always admired him and I still do. The biggest change I would say is, I think you've found more peace in the last few years. Absolutely. Peace, not carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders anymore. No not feeling responsible for every living, breathing, kinky human being in Edmonton. I don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, which is nice to see. It's almost like you've exhaled a little bit. Yep. I exhaled a lot, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but thank you for that. Yeah. And I think in some ways you took a step back. COVID made you take another step back. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been good for you to spend some time, but with people who know you instead of just people who walk around, like I did for the first few months with my eyes this big and <laughs> <Right? laughs> yeah. Making him Sir Scott and with Sir mm -hmm. Scott having that awe and having to be the be all end all in many ways. Extremely it's difficult, difficult. It's a burden. 
it's a burden to carry. It's a burden, I believe, to well, do that. Well, believe to a me, it made me very thankful for my husband, who was very good at keeping my feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Believe me, because there's a lot of people around. If you get into a position where people view you as having, I, I'm not even sure what the word is to tell you the truth. It's almost like they, they view you as a, a, a superior type of human mm -hmm. is, I think is probably about the only way that I could really put it. It's hard to have friends. It's hard to make friends sometimes. Well, in it's hard, hard to understand people that people aren't being genuine around you, yeah. you know, and they're usually an angle and they want something and, and you're unfortunately, a lot of them, yeah, and, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people are like that, like, you know, walk around and say, I know Sir Scott. <laughs> and it's like, so, <laughs> so does my mother. She doesn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right. I think in your assessment, when you said when you met him, he felt like a full-fledged, yeah, uh, you'd been in community much longer. You had gone past the a lot of the uncomfortable growing pains we all go through at the beginning, and we do. We were joking about this the other day. I was known for, I'll try anything once. And I did pretty much try anything. And my first few years in this journey surrounded not really with the kind of people that had my back or were supportive or encouraging. Um, yeah, that's because you don't really know how to judge those things at that point in your life. Yeah. So you... Made a lot of mistakes that cost, it cost me dearly. But um, it also taught you lessons oh, that you've never mm -hmm. forgotten. No, too. it made me really strong. Like I said, she's she's one of the most admirable women that I've ever met in my life. He's a flatter. No, I'm pretty honest. <laughs> you know that, Doug. Yep, telling the truth. Absolutely. I don't flatter. I just tell the I'm truth. Lucky. <laughs> and you are so red. I know. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years ago, his big fun was making me blush. It's oh, well, I did you just, just look at you at times. And here's a funny story. Very early on, we were at I Buddy's. Think I know the one you mean. <laughs> and there he is, and he's all kitted up. And so he's got big boots on, so he's even taller. As like I said, I, I'm short, I'm five foot three. So I'm like, I'm she like, came up to my belt buckle. And so I'm looking up at him and I'm just like, I'm tongue tied. Like I'm awestruck by this beautiful human being, which by the way, was not just the physical, like to me, you always radiated beautiful inside and out. So okay. I'm, I'm awestruck and we're talking and we're having a, a good conversation and this twink in this itty bitty, teeny weeny little underwear. Mm -hmm. Uh, comes right up and Scott has a large uh, ring and nipple piercing, large ring. And the little twink who's like about my size reached up and grabbed the... <laughs> and, grabbed, yank, and yanked. And yanked and said, did that hurt? And he looked at me, a very, always the gentleman, excuse me, darling, one moment, turned around, grabbed the guy's two nipples and lifted him and says, never touch, never touch put him back down and he says, what were we saying? <laughs> <laughs> Scared the poor little boy out of about 10 years of growth. Yeah. And he's never done that again. Um, no. Ever. No, I I'm always, sure. I always consider it an object lesson. <laughs> and let's talk about consent because that's mm -hmm. important. Because as we've been talking about it being a fetish, a kink and all the but at the root form, consent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Talk about it. What does consent mean? What does consent mean to you? I think it means literally everything and not just in the kinky context. I think consent is a form of respect, especially if you are a bottom. A lot of people we have in our dynamic with my master, it's like a consent, non-consent. <laughs> So there's, I know it gets really complicated, <laughs> but to the onlooker, you would think I don't have a say in anything. I am very lippy, but he's the boss. But in the back of both of our minds is the fact, the knowledge that at any time I can say, no, 
So it's consent, not consent. But I think it's probably the best lesson we could teach people in general. My belief. So I really do. It just a form of respect. Well, it goes beyond that. Consent actually means you have to have some type of empathy for your partner. Mm. You have to be able to put yourself in their shoes and see how you would want to be treated. And that's where the, the basis of consent comes from. You're not going to treat somebody like an object. Unless they ask very nicely. They better ask very nicely and repeatedly too, because I want to understand completely that the consent is there. But that doesn't mean that once you're given consent, it stays in perpetuity. Mm. You have to continually check in mm -hmm. to see if the consent is still there, mm -hmm. period. Because mm -hmm. circumstances change. Mm -hmm. And what you say yes to right now, you may say no to in five minutes from now, depending on how things happen. Yep. So consent isn't just like, do you want to do? Yep, fine. Boom. And away you go. It's like, do you want to do? Yeah, fine. Boom. Are you okay with this? Yeah, boom. You still okay. okay. You still okay? <laughs> yeah, boom. You know, and, and it's that continual check in that opens up the lines of communication. And that's where you get into the really, really fun stuff, especially for leather folk, because the majority of what we do relies on a huge element of trust between the players. Mm -hmm. And if there isn't that trust, you can't delve as deeply as you want to half the time. And it really goes both ways. I mm -hmm. think a lot of people don't realize the person bottoming has to trust. Yes, the person bottoming has to trust that the person topping isn't going to do permanent damage or harm. <clears throat> but the top has to trust that the bottom can articulate their needs and wants and is uh, doing it for the right reasons and that they're not going to do something. So you're, it's kind of giving permission back and forth and reaffirming the decisions you're making together. Absolutely. And that's the whole point. It is together. Mm -hmm. We don't exist without the other. We really don't. So that line of communication and that ability to trust everybody within the scene is essential. Like there is no other way around that. It is essential. Yep. Otherwise, like you said, to have deep, meaningful relationships or even a deep, meaningful scene, mm -hmm. if there's no trust, and no becomes, flow. It becomes all surface stuff. You might as well go home and beat off yourself. A lot of people will say <clears throat> to me that I don't appear submissive. And I don't think I really am submissive by nature, but no, I, you're more of a bottom. You're not a submissive. You're a bottom. But I say to people, I challenge, you cannot have a power exchange without power. You can't give somebody your power if you don't have any. And it's my job and any bottom's job to make sure that you're filling up your tank. And, and power comes from within. You can't, and somebody else can't give me power you've got to find your own so if you want a really good power exchange there's got to be power to give absolutely my two cents my point of view yeah. mileage now, very do, do, I, makes a lot of sense to me now for everybody who's listening to this conversation this is somewhat of an extension of the interview i did with scott last year approximately episode six or seven of the yeah. tales of the 2S LGBTQ+. At that time, it was Tales of the LGBTQ+. We've added the 2S here in 2022. Scott gave us 101, and he talked about different terminology. And so I come into the conversation with that information in my head, but I recognize that there are people who may not have listened to Scott's interview first before this one. And so yeah, they so might be... They will be punished. Yes. They will be punished in the best ways possible. But they might be uh, listening right now and going, Doug, Doug, you have to ask, why are you not asking this? And so I have to ask this one because you've said the word a few times. Master. 
Mm -hmm. What does that term mean? What it means to me, and I really want to emphasize that to me, because it will mean something really different to somebody else, is a negotiated power exchange between me and my husband. Where we have, and when I say negotiated, it was to the minutia, negotiated. What, what What's on the table, what wasn't on the table. And after being together almost 20 years, it's something we're constantly revisiting. Because Absolutely, as, because the situation changes as you go we, through your life. And we change as people. Yep. And, you know, we're getting older. So some of the stuff that was really hot and cool as part of our power exchange, which is not so practical anymore. Yeah, well, <laughs> my birthday is coming up very shortly and, and I got a couple of birthday cards and one of the lines <laughs> on my birthday card is, you know, you're getting older when your back goes out more than you do. And so I think it was important, especially with what you said about the term master, because of people's preconceived notion or the imagery behind that word. And what I really take away with what you said, Monique, was that negotiation and it's continual. Mm -hmm. May I say even it sounds healthy. It is. It is a negotiation. It is a negotiation all the time. And it has to be. And power exchange is one of the things that float our boat, which is very separate from kink in and of itself. It gets complicated. There are layers to the layers, if you will. But power exchange is part of our thing. But I think most people who would not know uh, would not guess. He doesn't treat me poorly. He doesn't talk down to me. He does actually humiliation on any form or level was definitely an off, off topic for me or off off the table for me, but yeah, somebody who doesn't know Mr. and I would, would, would have a, a difficult time sort of seeing through the real relationship. But again, most people don't see a real relationship when they see a couple anyway, yeah, they see true. what they want to see. So as we wrap up our conversation here, what do you want people to know? when they think about you and when they think about the leather community as a whole? Thanks. You know, at the end of the day, I think I don't want them to think about me as a leatherman. I think I want them to see me as a good person, period. Mm -hmm. Whether I express myself sexually different from everybody else shouldn't have any impact on how people view me hmm. and i like to think that i've done enough good in my time on this planet that that might leave somewhat of a lasting legacy but other than that no from from a leather point of view it's really from a, a deep personal point of view i just wanted to be the best version that I could of myself. And that's as simple as that. Yeah, I would mirror that. Ultimately, when you think about it, whether you're kinky, whether you consider yourself leather, whether you consider yourself a boulder, it doesn't, it's, I mean, kink is something we do. I know a lot of people say it is who I am. Yeah, it's a big part of, you know, your sexuality is a big part of who you are. But it's sure. not everything. But it's not who I am. It's, it's a, a portion. It's a portion of who I am. And I would hope that people would look back and think of me as a whole person, not not just part of that. And with a really nice bum. Please. <laughs> <laughs> This may not have actually been an episode for everybody to have watched on YouTube just to see the 50 shades of red that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no more of this 50 shades of gray. It's all yeah, red. It's, it's a new thing. Yeah, just to be a good person. But yeah. to tie it back to, to leather, if people want to think of Monique and leather, and what I would want them to think is that I was a person of integrity who who believed in some of the tenants. And I say some of the tenants because what 
leather is for me is not necessarily what leather is to you, but what was important to me, which were community, integrity, respect, respect communication. Uh, communication, those are all that I tried to walk the walk. Did I always succeed? No, but I worked at it all the time. Hmm. There you are. Work in progress. It's, so always a, it's always a work in progress. Hell, I'm still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this for 40 odd years. Yeah, you and your, you and my mister, same thing. Yep. I'm a baby. Gotta love her. Gotta love me, I'm the baby. That's part of our part of our group, I'm the youngest. <laughs> well, I absolutely enjoyed this conversation and learning more about both of you and about kink and leather and fetish and how it's played this role in your lives to be better humans, to fully know yourself. And that's what we're here for as human beings. And I really love the fact how you've tied everything together to this idea, the concept of yourself and always improving. And I know a lot of listeners are going to be thankful for that as well. And will be sending me questions to send to both of you as well as the time goes along. And I know both of you will be around to be able to answer those questions. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. There is one thing I would like to, to say if I can. One of the few fully leather male events is being revived this uh -huh. year. We do a yearly male leather retreat called kink camp it has been on hiatus for the last couple of years which i'm sure everybody can probably understand why the web address is uh, www.kinkcamp k i n k k a m p dot c a and we are open for registrations. We have a special guest coming in from Winnipeg to speak to everybody. And it is August 19th through the 21st, if I'm not mistaken, it's third weekend of August that it occurs. And if any of your listeners are both male or male appearing, which includes our transgendered brothers. You are more than welcome to take a look at that website to see if it is of interest and you are more than welcome to put in registrations. Every guy I know who's been to King Campus come out blown away. Not literally. <laughs> well, some of them did, but no. not, that's not part of the ticket. No, that's not, that's not a way. They've just been blown. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, the time is just blown away with each other. <laughs> and so, thank you once again, both Monique Wilson and Scott Bryan, for sharing your reflections here on Tales of the 2S LGBTQ. My name is Douglas Parsons. I want to remind you all to please make sure that you press subscribe here on YouTube starred ratings and reviews on those audio podcast sites such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts. If you have any questions, please reach out to me, tales 2 lgbtq plus plus at gmail.com. Again, thank you very much, Scott and Monique. I'm here to remind you to be good and always text when you get home. Until next time, everybody. <laughs>